Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. I'm Associate Professor Dr. Bahariah Khalid, Head Unit uh, of Hematology Oncology of HPUBM. Um, I will share with you this video on uh, patient blood management, uh, the first of its series, um, how it began. These are the electron microscopy uh, photographs of our uh, blood cells. I'm sure this is familiar with to you, the red blood cell, which is round and biconcave shaped. And as all of us understand, it's a very, uh, it plays a very important function in oxygen delivery to our tissues for repair and for growth. Um, the other picture actually shows you how a blood clot looks like under electron microscopy and how important the red cells are to actually maintain the hemostasis. It, uh, these are the red cells in stacks um, intermingled with meshwork of fibrins and, uh, and uh, platelets and some other few of the white cells to form a uh, platelet uh, uh, clot. Uh, covering the area of injury and I'm sure all of us uh, can uh, recap our undergraduate days that this uh, clotting uh, mechanism will be checked by a fibrinolytic pathway that breaks up all these meshworks and all the dead cells will be taken up by the macrophage um, and really put everything, uh, all the uh, clotting uh, activity in check so that there will not be an excessive clotting. So always have it bear in mind that every time we see our patients, we always need to look uh, or assess their bleeding and thrombotic risks because it should be in balance. In the pre-PBM era, uh, when there is anemia for a clinician, there's always attention when to transfuse. And when we look at the guidelines that were available before, um, it was just lengthy and Definitely, with um, strong clinical acumen, clinicians have always felt that their decisions are always right, are always right. And largely, what the registries or um, records have found that there are plenty of inappropriate use of blood transfusion, which I will show you later. As a result, it leads to more adverse events and definitely higher uh, costs in treating these patients. One of such registry is uh, the UK um, uh, Society, which is Serious Hazards of Transfusion that was formed in 1996. And their aim is, was actually to voluntary, voluntary anonymized uh, system uh, management to collect data on serious adverse events of transfusion. So whatever the orders by the surgeons or adverse events coming out from uh, the patient, uh, due to or after the effects of the transfusion will be recorded. And what they have found um, in the registry from 1996 to 2011, from almost 10,000 patients, that adverse events caused by error was very, very common. And the most um, worrying thing is that the inappropriate and unnecessary transfusion was seemed to be very high, which is almost more than 500 uh, number of reports in those almost 10,000 uh, cumulative uh, cases. Within the same year in 1996, there were a few bodies that looked into this. There was a special task force teamwork that um, came together from all around the world and formed this National Association of Bloodless Medicine and Surgery, which is quite a renowned uh, society. Uh, with um, also other societies such as the network of the advancement transfusion alternatives. And as I, were, had, I had illustrated earlier, that hemostasis and thrombosis do play a role in uh, transfusion uh, to patients. Uh, they rename themselves to advancement of patient blood management, hemostasis and thrombosis. Another society that uh, do have a big role in suggesting policies in uh, transfusion practices is the Society of Advancement of Blood Management, where the expert panels come from everywhere around the world. One of such um, uh, example of uh, advice they gave to WHO was uh, uh, in 2009, where they 
pointed out that patient blood management before surgery should be taken to optimize the patient's oat blood volume to minimize patient's blood loss and harness and optimize their physiologic tolerance to anemia. And this is where the three pillars of patient blood management came about. In our local scenario, we have our guidelines for rational use of blood and blood products in 2005. I'm not sure how, whether any of you had actually seen or read, uh, meaning the clinicians, uh, seen or read this guideline. It's quite comprehensive, but it's lengthy. And, um, it's, uh, and I've read through it uh, somehow in the course of my training, and it's very helpful for me to understand what transfusion is uh, uh, deal with. And another uh, guideline, which is meant for the laboratory personnel, but it is also good uh, to be read through by clinicians because we understand what are the issues, the problems that a laboratory face, a laboratory personnel face in, in terms to order or in terms to deliver the blood products that um, was requested by the clinicians. There was another uh, guideline just launched somewhere in March, if I'm not mistaken, this year, and I have yet to have got a copy of it. Perhaps any one of you might try to get one and share with us. And somehow, our practice have always been driven by the Australian physicians, the Australian clinicians. They have actually changed their practices change the outlook of their transfusion practices uh, since 2012 and they come over and train us for that and almost always um, we have actually guide ourselves uh, with their guidelines. Back to the anemia part, it has been proven uh, many years ago that pre-operative uh, evaluation uh, of anemia is very important because there are higher incidences higher incidences or the number of anemia patients uh, having anemia before any operation seems to increase with age and this is not really surprising because as age increases your bone marrow reserve reduces and it has been proven you know, from from uh, the registry uh, medicare registry in united states that anemia is associated with higher potent of mortality um, has proven a higher relative risk of two-year mortality uh, in this uh, almost 1.1 million patients that they have looked through. And within the same patient, they found that it increases the risk of all cause of death. M more strikingly, um, a trial or a paper in 2009 that actually looked through all patients that underwent uh, non-cardiac surgery. And those patients uh, with preoperative anemia seems to fare worse as it is associated with high uh, uh, post-operative mortality after 90 days. So with all these issues at hand, the suggestions that was made to the WHO ultimately to the lengthy definition but the first thing that, is, um, uh, that they have mentioned here, it should be a patient-focused, evidence-based and systematic approach to optimize the management of patients and transfusion of blood products. It's quite lengthy, but the SABM actually taken away um, the focus from transfusion and put the emphasis or emphasis to the patient outcomes. So, the definition here is more clearly defined uh, to be the timely application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts uh, designed to maintain hemoglobin concentration, optimize hemostasis, and minimize blood loss to improve the patient outcome. Now, the blood conservation ideas was actually explored many years ago because we do have patients who do who refuse to receive transfusion because of religious belief like the Jehovah witness and in the 90s when um hiv postwell jacob disease and viral hepatitis uh, were discovered um, they found higher prevalence of this uh, transfusion transmitted infection in cases that receive transfusions in the United Kingdom. And uh, what's more, uh, almost to be a landmark study, 
uh, in safety of transfusion is by the Canadian group, the Critical Care Trial in 1999, where there is evidence of uh, safety in restrictive transfusion rather than liberal. So we have, we, then the patient blood management became uh, uh, one of the standard care uh, of uh, uh, or standard way in some of the hospitals. But in real life, clinicians face a lot of uh, or, uh, uh, heterogeneous patients. Clinicians face patients with at risk of VTE. We have to look at the management of these patients. We have to be involved in it if they were going for surgery. And issues that need to be discussed was around prophylaxis, whether there is a benefit in bridging, and what shall be the treatment uh, post-op. Um, and how soon should we convert them to, to, to parental therapy or op, from parental to oral therapy, if need be. And within, uh, for that particular patient, patient comes with um, uh, a risk of uh, thrombosis, let's say, what are the special modalities the surgeons can, can use during the surgery? Besides whatever uh, the risk that they have at hand, we need to explore other contributors of uh, VTE that this patient might have. And it has to be coupled every time. It has to be coupled with the risk assessment of bleeding. Where it is very important that you have not missed anything else in order to achieve the optimal hemostasis and thrombosis for this patient. And the patient with at risk of bleeding, um, we have to look uh, what are the procedures that they're planning to do. Are they going to be major procedures like um, cabbage with higher estimated blood loss compared to just a simple incision drainage? And who are the people who's doing it? Um, with um, what all the uh, ways and methods and tricks that the surgeons have uh, at hand or, ex or being an expert in to control the bleeding during the operation. The second hemostasis is much more trickier, but it should be dealt with in all disciplines, all across the board. And at least by having full blood count, uh, the coagulation profile and wherever necessary, the serum fibrinogen can give us some idea how the clotting factors are doing, whether the patients have enough serum uh, fibrinogen to form a good quality clot or the patient have good numbers of RBC um, to achieve that. Again, there shall be a need uh, to see for other contributors of risk of bleeding and these need to be balanced with the risk of VTE. And ideally, we need to put them in balance, pre-op, intra-op, and even post-op. So here now, during PBM era, we use something old and something new. The new idea is, has to be patient focus. Try to promote the erythropoiesis to, re uh, erythropoiesis to reduce the chance of transfusion. And everybody, have a say, they can have a say, but we have to look what are the benefit, benefits and the risks. And everyone should have this attitude of catching it up by tying it all up in timely fashion. And I always um, advise this 12 hours time frame because there are some uh, small, small studies that shows if you can help to stop the bleeding in less than 12 hours, it is high likely that the patient will have a good outcome. Because in the end, what's more important is having a good blood clot to secure the hemostasis and, uh, and making sure there is a good fibrinolytic activity at hand to ensure this clot will be in check. So PBM elements, again, I emphasize, multidisciplinary, multimodality. It has to be patient-centered with our good clinical practice in place. And the goal is to conserve patients' own blood. Um, with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll see you in the next video. Assalamualaikum.